Hey students, this is Miss Wolf. I'm going to be reading aloud the story, The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell. Um, in this story, if you're following along with the text I posted online, which you should be doing, there are questions in the margins um, for the plot, the setting, different lines to identify. As I read, I want you to pause the story and type these answers into the document I've posted on Google Classroom. Okay, that way we can be tracking what we're reading together. Again, you can just type in your answers. If it says something like circle the words in lines seven through 15, then I want you to write in Google Classroom which words you circled and why. Okay, so this is a little bit different than we would normally do be doing it, but you'll just use the, the Google Classroom document almost like a journal um, to answer the questions as we read. Again, you can pause and play and replay parts of the story at your own pace. Um, so whenever you see one of those pop up in the margin, just pause the story and do that task. Okay, remember that the lines, the numbers are in the left margin. So it says 10, 20, 30, 40, and you just count the lines in between those numbers to know what line we are on. So I'm just gonna read straight through the story um, if I see a footnote, I will go down to the bottom of the page and define that word. Um, and I might interject some other helpful tips as we read. But other than that, you go through the story and you are in control of pausing to do the tasks in the margins. All right, here we go. The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell. Off there to the right somewhere is a large island, said Mr. Whitney. It's rather a mystery. What island is it? Rainsford asked. The old charts call it Ship Trap Island, Whitney replied. A suggestive name, isn't it? Sailors have a curious dread of the place. I don't know why. Some superstition. Can't see it, remarked Rainsford, trying to peer through the dank tropical night that was palpable as it pressed its thick, warm blackness in upon the yacht. You've good eyes, said Whitney with a laugh, and I've seen you pick off a moose moving in the brown fall bush at 400 yards, but even you can't see four miles or so through this moonless Caribbean night. Nor four yards, admitted Rainsford. Ugh, it's like moist black velvet. It will be light in Rio, promised Whitney. We should make it in a few days. I hope the Jaguar guns have come in from Purdy's. Footnote, Purdy's is a British manufacturer of hunting equipment. We should have some good hunting up in the Amazon. Great sport hunting. The best sport in the world, agreed Rainsford. For the hunter, amended Whitney, not for the jaguar. Don't talk rot, Whitney, said Rainsford. You're a big game hunter, not a philosopher. Who cares how the jaguar feels? Perhaps the jaguar does, observed Whitney. Bah, they've no understanding. Even so, I'd rather think they understand one thing, fear. The fear of pain and the fear of death. Nonsense, laughed Rainsford. This hot weather is making you soft, Whitney. Be a realist. The world is made up of two classes, the hunters and the huntees. Luckily, you and I are the hunters. Do you think we've passed that island yet? I can't tell in the dark. I hope so. Why, asked Rainsford. The place has a bad re uh, reputation, a bad one. Cannibals, suggested Rainsford. Hardly. Even cannibals wouldn't live in such a godforsaken place. But it's gotten into sailor lore somehow. Didn't you notice that the crew's nerves seemed a bit jumpy today? They were a bit strange, now that you mention it. Even Captain Nielsen. Yes, even that tough-minded old Swede, who'd go up to the devil himself and ask him for a light. Those fishy blue eyes held a look I never saw there before. All I could get out of him was, This place has an evil name among seafaring men, sir. Then he said to me very gravely, don't you feel anything? As if the air about us was actually poisonous. Now, you mustn't laugh when I tell you this. I did feel something like a sudden chill. There was no breeze. The sea was as flat as a plate glass window. We were drawing near the island then. What I felt was a, a mental chill, a sort of sudden dread. Pure imagination, said Rainsford. One superstitious sailor can taint the whole ship's company with his fear. Maybe. But sometimes I think sailors have an extra sense that tells them when they are in danger. Sometimes I think evil is a tangible thing, with wavelengths just as sound and light have. An evil place can, so to speak, 
broadcast vibrations of evil. Anyhow, I'm glad we're getting out of this zone. Well, I think I'll turn in now, Rainsford. I'm not sleepy, said Rainsford. I'm going to smoke another pipe on the after deck. Good night then, Rainsford. I'll see you at breakfast. Right. Good night, Whitney. There was no sound in the night as Rainsford sat there, but the muffled throb of the engine that drove the yacht swiftly through the darkness and the swish and ripple of the wash of the propeller. Rainsford, reclining in a steamer chair, indolently, which means lazily, footnote, puffed on his favorite briar, which is a tobacco pipe made from the root of a briar bush or tree, footnote. The sensuous drowsiness of the night was on him. It's so dark, he thought, that I could sleep without closing my eyes. The night would be my eyelids. An abrupt sound startled him. Off to the right, he heard it, and his ears, expert in such manners, could not be mistaken. Again, he heard the sound, and again. Somewhere off in the black blackness, someone had fired a gun three times. Rainsford sprang up and moved quickly to the rail, mystified. He strained his eyes in the direction from which the reports had come, but it was like trying to see through a blanket. He leapt upon the rail and balanced himself there to get a greater elevation. His pipe striking a rope was knocked from his mouth. He lunged for it. A short, hoarse cry came from his lips as he realized he had reached too far and had lost his balance. The cry was pinched off short as the blood-warm waters of the Caribbean Sea closed over his head. He struggled up to the surface and tried to cry out, but the wash from the speeding yacht slapped him in the face and the salt water in his open mouth made him gag and strangle. Desperately, he struck out with strong strokes after the receding lights of the yacht. Receding means becoming more distant. But he stopped before he had swum 50 feet. A certain cool-headedness had come to him. It was not the first time he had been in a tight place. There was a chance that his cries could be heard by someone aboard the yacht, but that chance was slender and grew more slender as the yacht raced on. He wrestled himself out of his clothes and shouted with all of his power. The lights of the yacht became faint and ever-vanishing fireflies. Then they were blotted out entirely by the night. Rainsford remembered the shots. They had come from the right, and doggedly he swam in that direction, swimming with slow, deliberate strokes, conserving his strength. For a seemingly endless time he fought the sea. He began to count his strokes. He could do possibly a hundred more, and then Rainsford heard a sound. It came out of the darkness, a high, screaming sound, the sound of an animal in an extremity of anguish and terror. He did not recognize the animal that had made the sound. He did not try to. With fresh vitality, he swam towards the sound. He heard it again. Then it was cut short by another noise. Crisp staccato. Pistol shot, muttered Rainsford, swimming on. Ten minutes of determined effort brought another sound to his ears, the most welcome he had ever heard. The muttering and growling of the sea breaking on a rocky shore. He was almost on the rocks before he saw them. On a night less calm, he would have been shattered against them. With his remaining strength, he dragged himself from the swirling waters. Jagged crags appeared to jut into the opaqueness, which means darkness. Something opaque does not let the light shine through. He forced himself upward, hand over hand, gasping. His hands raw, he reached a flat place at the top. Dense jungle came down to the very edge of the cliffs. What perils that tangle of trees and underbrush might hold for him did not concern Rainsford just then. All he knew was that he was safe from his enemy, the sea, and that utter weariness was on him. He flung himself down at the jungle edge and tumbled headlong into the deepest sleep of his life. When he opened his eyes, he knew from the position of the sun that it was late in the afternoon. Sleep had given him new vigor. A sharp hunger was picking at him. He looked about him almost cheerfully. Where there are pistol shots, there are men. Where there are men, there is food, he thought. But what kind of men, he wondered, in so forbidding a place? An unbroken front of snarled and ragged jungle fringed the shore. He saw no sign of a trail through the closely knit web of weeds and trees. It was easier to go along the shore, and Rainsford floundered along by the water. 
not far from where he had landed, he stopped. Some wounded thing by the evidence a large animal had thrashed about in the underbrush. The jungle weeds were crushed down and the moss was lacerated. One patch of weeds was stained crimson, which is red. A small glittering object not far away caught Rainsford's eye and he picked it up. It was an empty cartridge. A twenty-two, he remarked. That's odd. It must have been a fairly large animal, too. The hunter had his nerve with him to tackle it with a light gun. It's clear that the brute put up a fight. I suppose the first three shots I heard was when the hunter flushed his quarry. Quarry, meaning uh, he drove the animal he was hunting out of its hiding place, in the footnote, and wounded it. The last shot was when he trailed it here and finished it. He examined the ground closely and found what he had hoped to find, the print of hunting boots. They pointed along the cliff in a direction he had been going. Eagerly, he hurried along, now slipping on a rotten log or a loose stone, but making headway. Night was beginning to settle down on the island. Bleak darkness was blackening out the sea and jungle when Rainsford sighted the lights. He came upon them as he turned a crook in the coastline, and his first thought was that he had come upon a village, for there were many lights. But as he forged along, he saw to his great astonishment that all of the lights were in one enormous building, a lofty structure with pointed towers plunging upward into the gloom. His eyes made out the shadowy outlines of a palatial chateau. Footnote means a large country house, kind of like a castle. It was set on a high bluff, and on three sides of it, cliffs dived down to where the sea licked greedy lips in the shadows. Mirage, thought Rainsford, but it was no mirage. He found when he opened the tall, spiked iron gate. The stone steps were real enough. The massive door with a leering gargoyle for a knocker was real enough. Yet about it all hung an air of unreality. He lifted the knocker and it creaked up stiffly, as if it had never before been used. He let it fall and it startled him with its booming loudness. He thought he heard steps within. The door remained closed. Again, Rainsford lifted the heavy knocker and let it fall. The door opened then, opened as suddenly as if it were on a spring, and Rainsford stood blinking in the river of a glaring gold light that poured out. The first thing Rainsford's eyes discerned was the largest man Rainsford had ever seen, a gigantic creature, solidly made and black bearded to the waist. In his hand, the man held a long barreled revolver and he was pointing it straight at Rainsford's heart. Out of the snarl of beard, two small eyes regarded Rainsford. Don't be alarmed, said Rainsford with a smile, which he hoped was disarming, which means like um, hoped was removing this man's fears. I'm no robber. I fell off a yacht. My name is Sanger Rainsford of New York City. The menacing look in the eyes did not change. The revol revolver pointed as rigidly as if the giant were a statue. He gave no sign that he understood Rainsford's words or that he had even heard them. He was dressed in uniform, a black uniform trimmed with gray astrakhan, which means kind of like um, wool. I'm Sanger Rainsford of New York, Rainsford began again. I fell off a yacht. I am hungry. The man's only answer was to raise with his thumb the hammer of his revolver. Then Rainsford saw the man's free hand go to his forehead in a military salute, and he saw him click his heels together and stand at attention. Another man was coming down the broad marble steps, an erect slender man in evening clothes. He advanced to Rainsford and held out his hand. In a cultivated voice marked by a slight accent that gave it added precision and deliberateness, he said, in a, it is a very great pleasure and honor to welcome Mr. Sanger Rainsford, the celebrated hunter, to my home. Automatically, Rainsford shook the man's hand. I've read your book about hunting snow leopards in Tibet, you see, explained the man. I am General Zaroff. Rainsford's first impression was that the man was singularly handsome. His second was that there was an original, almost bizarre quality about the general's face. He was a tall man past middle age, for his hair was a vivid white, but his thick eyebrows and pointed military mustache were as black as the night from which Rainsford had come. His eyes, too, were black and very bright. 
He had high cheekbones, a sharp cut nose, a spare dark face, the face of a man used to giving orders, the face of an aristocrat. Turning to the giant in uniform, the general made a sign. The giant put away his pistol, saluted, withdrew. Ivan is an incredibly strong fellow, remarked the general, but he has the misfortune to be deaf. It says deaf and dumb, but that phrase is no longer used, so you can just cross out and dumb. It just means that he's deaf and he doesn't speak. A simple fellow, but I'm afraid, like all of his race, a bit of a savage. Is he Russian? He is a Cossack, said the general, and his smile showed red lips and pointed teeth. So am I. Come, he said. We shouldn't be chatting here. We can talk later. Now you want clothes, food, and rest. You shall have them. This is a most restful spot. Ivan had reappeared, and the general spoke to him with lips that moved but gave forth no sound. Follow Ivan, if you please, Mr. Rainsford, said the general. I was about to have my dinner when you came. I'll wait for you. You'll find that my clothes will fit you, I think. It was to a huge beam ceiling bedroom with a canopied bed big enough for six men that Rainsford followed the silent giant. Ivan laid out an evening suit, and Rainsford, as he put it on, noticed that it came from a London tailor who ordinarily cut and sewed for none below the rank of Duke. The dining room to which Ivan conducted him was in many ways remarkable. There was a medieval magnificence about it. It suggested a baronial hall of feudal times, with its oaken panels, its high ceiling, its vast refectory table, where two score men could sit down to eat. About the hall were the mounted heads of many animals, lions, tigers, elephants, moose, bears, Larger or more perfect specimens Rainford's, Rainsford had never seen. At the great table, the general was sitting alone. You'll have a cocktail, Mr. Rainsford, he suggested. The cocktail was surpassingly good. And, Rainsford noted, the table appointments were of the finest. The linen, the crystal, the silver, the china. They were eating borscht, the rich red soup with sour cream so dear to Russian palates. Half apologetically, General Zaroff said, we do our best to preserve the amenities, which means comforts or conveniences, of civilization here. Please forgive any lapses. We are well off the beaten track, you know. Do you think the champagne has suffered from its long ocean trip? Not in the least, declared Rainsford. He was finding the general a most thoughtful and affable host, a true cosmopolite, which means a knowledgeable citizen of the world. But there was one small trait of the general's that made Rainsford uncomfortable. Whenever he looked up from his plate, he found the general studying him, appraising him narrowly. Perhaps, said General Zaroff, you were surprised that I recognized your name. You see, I read all books on hunting, published in English, French, and Russian. I have but one passion in my life, Mr. Rainsford, and it is the hunt. You have some wonderful heads here, said Rainsford. He ate a particularly well-cooked filet mignon. That Cape Buffalo is the largest I ever saw. Oh, that fellow, yes, he was a monster. Did he charge you? Hurled me against a tree, said the general. Fractured my skull, but I got the brute. I've always thought, said Rainsford, that the Cape Buffalo was the most dangerous of all big game. For a moment, the general did not reply. He was smiling his curious red lip smile. Then he said slowly, no, you are wrong, sir. The Cape Buffalo is not the most dangerous big game. He sipped his wine. Here in my preserve on the island, he said in the same slow tone, I hunt more dangerous game. Rainsford expressed his surprise. Is there big game on this island? The general nodded, the biggest. Really? Oh, it isn't here naturally, of course. I have to stock the island. What have you imported, General? Rainsford asked. Tigers? The general smiled. No, he said. Hunting tigers ceased to interest me some years ago. I exhausted their possibilities, you see. No thrill left in tigers. No real danger. I live for danger, Mr. Rainsford. The general took from his pocket a gold cigarette case and offered his guest a long black cigarette with a silver tip. It was perfumed and gave off a smell like incense. We will have some capital hunting, you and I, said the general. I shall be most glad to have your society. But what game, began Rainsford. I'll tell you, said the general. You will be amused, I know. I think I must say, in all modesty, that I've done a rare thing. I have invented a new sensation. May I pour you another glass of port, Mr. Rainsford? Thank you, general. 
The general filled both glasses and said, God makes some men poets, some he makes kings, and some beggars. Me, he made a hunter. My hand was made for the trigger, my father said. He was a very rich man with a quarter of a million acres in the Crimea, which is a peninsula in Ukraine that's jutting out into the Black Sea. And he was an ardent sportsman. When I was only five years old, he gave me a little gun, specially made in Moscow, for me to shoot sparrows with. When I shot some of his prized turkeys with it, he did not punish me. He complimented me on my marksmanship. I killed my first bear in the Caucasus when I was 10, which is a mountain range between Southeastern Europe and Western Asia. My whole life has been one prolonged hunt. I went into the army. I was expected of noblemen's sons and for a time commanded a division of Cossack cavalry, but my real interest was always the hunt. I have hunted every kind of game in every land. It would be impossible for me to tell you how many animals I have killed. The general popped out a cigarette. After the debacle, which means, uh, or in this case is referring to an overwhelming defeat. He's referring to the Russian Revolution of 1917 in which the Tsar and his government were overthrown. So after the debacle in Russia, I left the country for it was imprudent for an officer of the Tsar to stay there. Many noble Russians lost everything. I, luckily, had invested heavily in American securities, so I shall never have to open a tea room in Monte Carlo, which is a gambling resort in Monaco, um, which is a country in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, or drive a taxi in Paris. Naturally, I continue to hunt grizzlies in your Rockies, crocodiles in the Ganges, which is a river in northern India and Bangladesh, rhinoceroses in East Africa. It was in Africa that the Cape Buffalo hit me and laid me up for six months. As soon as I recovered, I started for the Amazon to hunt jaguars, for I had heard that they were unusually cunning. They weren't, the Cossack sighed. They were no match at all for a hunter with his wits about him and a high-powered rifle. I was bitterly disappointed. I was lying in my tent with a splitting headache one night when a terrible thought pushed its way into my mind. Hunting was beginning to bore me, and hunting, remember, had been my life. I have heard that in America, businessmen often go to pieces when they give up the business that has been their life. Yes, that's so, said Rainsford. The general smiled. I had no wish to go to pieces, he said. I must do something. Now, mine is an analytical mind, Mr. Rainsford. Doubtless, that is why I enjoy the problems of the chase. No doubt, General Zara. So, continued the general, I asked myself, why the hunt no longer fascinated me? You are much younger than I am, Mr. Rainsford, and have not hunted as much, but you perhaps could guess the answer. What was it? Simply this. Hunting had ceased to be what you call a sporting proposition. It had become too easy. I always got my quarry. Always. There's no greater bore than perfection. The general lit a fresh cigarette. No animal had a chance with me anymore. That is no boast. It is a mathematical certainty. The animal had nothing but his legs and his instinct. Instinct is no match for reason. When I thought of this, it was a tragic moment for me, I can tell you. Rainsford leaned across the table, absorbed in what his host was saying. It came to me as an inspiration what I must do, the general went on. And that was? The general smiled, the quiet smile of one who has faced an obstacle and surmounted it with success. I had to invent a new animal to hunt, he said. A new animal? You're joking. Not at all, said the general. I never joke about hunting. I needed a new animal. I found one. So I bought this island, built this house, and here I do my hunting. The island is perfect for my purposes. There are jungles with a maze of trails in them, hills, swamps, but the animal, General Zara? Oh, said the general, it supplies me with the most exciting hunting in the world. No other hunting compares with it for an instant. Every day I hunt and I never grow bored now, for I have a quarry with which I can match my wits. Rainsford's bewilderment showed on his face. I wanted the ideal animal to hunt, explained the general. So I said, what are the attributes of an ideal quarry? And the answer was, of course, it must have courage, cunning, and above all, it must be able to reason. But no animal can reason, objected Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general, there's one that can. But you can't mean, gasped Rainsford. And why not? I can't believe you are serious, General Zaroff. This is a grisly joke. Why should I not be serious? I am speaking of hunting. 
Hunting? Good God, General Zaroff, what you speak of is murder. The general laughed with entire good nature. He regarded Rainsford quizzically. I refuse to believe that so modern and civilized a young man as you seems to harbor romantic ideas about the value of human life. Surely your experiences in the war did not make me condone cold-blooded murder, finished Rainsford stiffly. Laughter shook the general. How extraordinarily droll you are, he said. One does not expect nowadays to find a young man of the educated class, even in America, with such a naive, and if I may say so, mid-Victorian point of view. It's like finding a snuff box in a limousine. Ah, oh, well, doubtless you had Puritan ancestors. So many Americans appear to have had. I'll wager you'll forget your notions when you go hunting with me. You've a genuine new thrill in store for you, Mr. Rainsford. Thank you. I'm a hunter, not a murderer. Dear me, said the general, quite unruffled. Again, that unpleasant word. But I think I can show you that your scruples or your feelings of doubt or guilt are quite ill-founded. Yes? Life is for the strong, to be lived by the strong, and if needed be, taken by the strong. The weak of the world were put here to give the strong pleasure. I am strong. Why should I not use my gift? If I wish to hunt, why should I not? I hunt the scum of the earth, sailors from tramp ships, lascars. More than a score of them. But they are men, said Rainsford hotly. Precisely, said the general. That is why I use them. It gives me pleasure. They can reason after a fashion, so they are dangerous. But where do you get them? The general's left eyelid fluttered down in a wink. This island is called Ship Trap, he answered. Sometimes an angry god of the high seas sends them to me. Sometimes, when Providence is not so kind, I help Providence a bit. Come to the window with me. Rainsford went to the window and looked out towards the sea. Watch out there, exclaimed the general, pointing into the night. Rainsford's eyes saw only blackness, and then, as the general pressed a button, far out to sea, Rainsford saw the flash of lights. The general chuckled. They indicate a channel, he said, where there is none. Giant rocks with razor edges crouch like a sea monster with wide open jaws. They can crush a ship as easily as I crush this nut. He dropped a walnut on the hardwood floor and brought his heel grinding down on it. Oh yes, he said casually as if in answer to a question. I have electricity. We try to be civilized here. Civilized and you shoot down men? A trace of anger was in the general's black eyes, but it was there for but a second. And he said, in his most pleasant manner, Dear me, what a righteous young man you are. I assure you I do not do the thing that you suggest. That would be barbarous. I treat these visitors with every consideration. They get plenty of good food and exercise. They get into splendid physical condition. You shall see for yourself tomorrow. What do you mean? We'll visit my training school, smiled the general. It's in the cellar. I have about a dozen pupils down there now. They're from the Spanish Bark San Lucar and had the bad luck to go on the rocks out there. A very inferior lot, I regret to say. Poor specimens and more accustomed to the deck than to the jungle. He raised his hand and Ivan, who served as a waiter, brought thick Turkish coffee. Rainsford, with an effort, held his tongue in check. It's a game, you see, pursued the gen general blandly. I suggest to one of them that we go hunting. I give him a supply of food and an excellent hunting knife. I give him three hours start. I am to follow, armed with only a pistol of the smallest caliber and range. If my quarry eludes me for three whole days, he wins the game. If I find him, the general smiled, he loses. Suppose he refuses to be hunted. Oh, said the general. I give him his option, of course. He need not play the game if he doesn't wish to. If he does not wish to hunt, I turn him over to Ivan. Ivan once had the honor of serving as official nowder to the great white czar, and he has his own ideas of sport. Invariably, Mr. Rainsford, invariably, they choose the hunt. And if they win, the smile on the general's face widened. To date, I have not lost, he said. Then he added hastily, I don't wish you to think me a braggart, Mr. Rainsford. Many of them afford only the most elementary sort of problem. Occasionally, I do strike a tartar. One almost did win. I eventually had to use the dogs. The dogs? This way, please. I'll show you.
The general steered Rainsford to a window. The lights from the windows sent a flickering illumination that made grotesque patterns on the courtyard below, and Rainsford could see moving about there a dozen or so huge black shapes as they turned toward him. Their eyes glittered greenly. A rather good lot, I think, observed the general. They are let out at seven every night. If anyone should try to get into my house or out of it, something extremely regrettable would occur to him. He hummed a snatch of a song from the Folies Berger, which is a famous nightclub in Paris. And now, said the general, I want to show you my new collection of heads. Will you come with me to the library? I hope, said Rainsford, that you will excuse me tonight, General Zaroff. I'm really not feeling well. Ah, oh, indeed, the general inquired solicitously. Well, I suppose that's only natural after a long swim. You need a good restful night's sleep. Tomorrow you'll feel like a new man, I'll wager. Then we'll hunt, eh? I've got one rather promising prospect. Rainsford was scurrying from the room. Sorry, can't go. you can't go with me tonight, called the general. I expect a rather fair sport. He looks resourceful. Well, good night, Mr. Rainsford. I hope you have a good night's rest. The bed was good in the pajamas of the softest silk, and he was tired in every fiber of his being, but nevertheless, Rainsford could not quiet his brain with the opiate of sleep. He lay his eyes wide open. Once he thought he heard stealthy steps in the corridor outside his room. He sought to throw open the door. It, it would not open. He went to the window and looked out. His room was high up in one of the towers. The lights of the chateau were out now, and it was dark and silent, but there was a fragment of a sallow moon, and by its wan light he could see dimly the courtyard. There, weaving in and out in a pattern of shadow, were black, noiseless forms. The hounds heard him at the window and looked up expectantly with their green eyes. Rainsford went back to the bed and lay down, but many methods he tried to put himself to sleep. He had achieved a doze when, just as morning began to come, he heard far off in the jungle the faint report of a pistol. General Zaroff did not appear until luncheon. He was dressed faultlessly in the tweeds of a country squire. He was solicitous about the state of Rainsford's health. As for me, sighed the general, I do not feel so well. I am worried, Mr. Rainsford. Last night I detected traces of my old complaint. To Rainsford's questioning glance, the general said, Ennui, boredom. Then, taking a second helping of Crepe Suzette, the general explained the hunting was not good last night. The fellow lost his head. He made a straight trail that offered no problems at all. That's the trouble with these sailors. They have dull brains to begin with, and they do not know how to get about in the woods. They do excessively stupid and obvious things. It's most annoying. Will you have another glass of Chablis, Mr. Rainsford? General, said Rainsford firmly, I wish to leave this island at once. The general raised his thickets of eyebrows. He seemed hurt. But my dear fellow, the general protested, you've only just come. You've had no hunting. I wish to go today, said Rainsford. He saw the dead black eyes of the general on him, studying him. General Zaroff's face suddenly brightened. He filled Rainsford's glass with venerable Chablis from a dusty bottle. Tonight, said the general, we will hunt you and I. Rainsford shook his head. No, general, he said, I will not hunt. The general shrugged his shoulders and delicately ate a hothouse grape. As you wish, my friend, he said. The choice rests entirely with you. But may I not venture to suggest that you will find my idea of sport more diverting than Ivan's? He nodded towards the corner, where the giant stood, scowling, his thick arms crossed across on his hog's head of a chest. You don't mean, cried Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general, have I not told you that I always mean what I say about hunting? This is really an inspiration. I drink to a foeman worthy of my steel at last. The general raised his glass, but Rainsford sat staring at him. You'll find this game worth playing, the general said enthusiastically. Your brain against mine, your woodcraft against mine, your strength and stamina against mine, outdoor chess, and the stake is not without value, eh? And if I win, began Rainsford huskily, I'll cheerfully acknowledge myself defeated if I do not find you by midnight of the third day, said the general. My sloop will place you on the mainland near town. The general read what Rainsford was thinking. Oh, you can trust me, said the Cossack. I will give you my word as a gentleman and a sportsman. Of course, you in turn must agree to say nothing of your visit here. I'll agree to nothing of the kind, said Rainsford. Oh, said the general, in that case. But why discuss that now? 
three days hence we can discuss it over a bottle of Veuve Cl Cloquet unless the general sipped his wine. The general sipped his wine. Then a businesslike air animated him. Ivan, he said to Rainsford, will su supply you with hunting clothes, food, a knife. I suggest you wear moccasins. They leave a poorer trail. I suggest, too, that you avoid the big swamp in the southeast corner of the island. We call it Death Swamp. There's quicksand there. One foolish fellow tried it. The deplorable part of it was that Lazarus followed him. You can imagine my feelings, Mr. Rainsford. I loved Lazarus. He was the finest hound in my pack. Well, I must beg you to excuse me now. I always take a siesta after lunch. You'll hardly have time for a nap, I fear. You'll want to start, no doubt. I shall not follow you till dusk. Hunting at night is so much more exciting than by day, don't you think? Au revoir, Mr. Rainsford. Au revoir. General Zaroff, with a deep, courtly bow, strolled from the room. From another door came Ivan. Under one arm he carried khaki hunting clothes, a haversack of food, a leather sheath containing a long-bladed hunting knife. His right hand rested on a cocked revolver, thrust in the crimson sash about his waist. Rainsford had followed, had fought his way through the brush for two hours. I must keep my nerve. I must keep my nerve, he said through tight teeth. He had not been entirely clear-headed when the chateau gates snapped shut behind him. His whole idea at first was to put distance between himself and General Zaroff, and to this end, he had plunged along, spurred on by the sharp rolls of something very like panic. Now he got a grip on himself, had stopped, and was taking stock of himself and the situation. He saw that straight flight was futile. Inevitably, it would bring him face to face with the sea. He was in a picture with a frame of water, and his operations clearly must take place within that frame. I'll give him a trail to follow, muttered Rainsford, and he struck off from the rude paths he had been following into the trackless wilderness. He executed a series of intricate loops. He doubled on his trail again and again, recalling all the lore of the fox hunt and all the dodges of the fox. Night found him leg-weary, with hands and face lashed by the branches, on a thickly wooden ridge. He knew it would be insane to blunder on through the dark, even if he had had the strength. His need for rest was imperative, and he thought, I have played the fox, now I must play the cat of the fable. A big tree with a thick trunk and outspread branches was nearby, and taking care to leave not the slightest mark, he climbed up into the crotch and stretching out, on one of the broad limbs, after a fashion, rested. Rest brought him new confidence and almost a feeling of security. Even so zealous a hunter as General Zaroff could not trace him there, he told himself. Only the devil himself could follow. That complicated of a trail through the jungle after dark, but perhaps the general was a devil. An apprehensive night crawled slowly by like a wounded snake, and sleep did not visit Rainsford, although the silence of the dead world was on the jungle. Toward morning, when a uh, dingy gray was varnishing the sky, the cry of some startled bird focused Rainsford's attention in that direction. Something was coming through the bush, coming slowly, carefully, coming by the same winding way Rainsford had come. He flattened himself down on the limb, and through a screen of leaves almost as thick as tapestry, he watched. The thing that was approaching was a man. It was General Zaroff. He made his way along with his eyes fixed in utmost concentration on the ground before him. He paused almost beneath the tree, dropped to his knees, and studied the ground. Rainsford's impulse was to hurl himself down like a panther, but he saw the General's right hand held something metallic, a small automatic pistol. The hunter shook his head several times, as if he were puzzled. Then he straightened up and took from his case one of his black cigarettes. Its pungent, incense-like smoke floated up to Rainsford's nostrils. Rainsford held his breath. The general's eyes had left the ground and were traveling inch by inch up the tree. Rainsford froze there, every muscle tensed for a spring. But the sharp eyes of the hunter stopped before they reached the limb where Rainsford lay. A smile spread over his brown face. Very deliberately, he blew a smoke ring into the air. Then he turned his back on the tree and walked carelessly away, back along the trail he had come. The swish of the underbrush against his hunting boots grew fainter and fainter. Then pent-up air burst hotly from Rainsford's lungs. His first thought made him feel sick and numb. The general could follow a trail through the woods at night. He could follow an extremely difficult trail. He must have uncanny powers. 
Only by the merest chance had the Cossack failed to see his quarry. Rainsford's second thought was even more terrible. It sent a shudder of cold horror through his whole being. Why had the general smiled? Why had he turned back? Rainsford did not want to believe what his reason told him was true, but the truth was as evident as the sun that had by now pushed through the morning mists. The general was playing with him. The general was saving him for another day's, report, another day's sport. The Cossack was the cat. He was the mouse. Then it was that Rainsford knew the full meaning of terror. I will not lose my nerve. I will not. He slid down from the tree and struck off again into the woods. His face was set and he forced the machinery of his mind to function. 300 yards from his hiding place, he stopped where a huge dead tree leaned precariously on a smaller living one. Throwing off his sack of food, Rainsford took his knife from his sheath and began to work with all of his energy. The job was finished at last and he threw himself down behind a fallen log a hundred feet away. He did not have to wait long. The cat was coming again to play with the mouse. Following the trail with the sureness of a bloodhound came General Zaroff. Nothing escaped those searching black eyes. No crushed blade of grass, no bent twig, no mark, no matter how faint in the moss. So intent was the Cossack on his stalking that he was upon the thing that Rainsford had made before he saw it. His foot touched the protruding bow that was the trigger. Even as he touched it, the general sensed his danger and leapt back with the agility of an ape. But he was not quite quick enough. The dead tree, delicately adjusted to rest on the cut living one, crashed down and struck the general a glancing blow on the shoulder as it fell. But for his alertness, he must have been smashed beneath it. He staggered, but he did not fall nor did he drop his revolver. He stood there rubbing his injured shoulder and Rainsford, with fear again gripping his heart, heard the general's mocking laugh ring through the jungle. Rainsford called the general, if you are within the sound of my voice as I suppose you are, let me congratulate you. Not many men know how to make a Malay man catcher. Luckily for me, I too have hunted in Malacca. You are proving interesting, Mr. Rainsford. I'm going now to have my wound addressed. It is only a slight one, but I shall be back. I shall be back. When the general, nursing his bruised shoulder, had gone, Rainsford took up his flight again. It was a flight now, a desperate, hopeless flight that carried him on for some hours. Dusk came, then darkness, and still he pressed on. The ground grew softer under his moccasins. The vegetation grew ranker, denser. Insects bit him savagely. Then, as he stepped forward, his foot sank into the ooze. He tried to wrench it back, but the muck sucked viciously at his foot as if it were a giant leech. When, with a violent effort, he tore loose. He knew where he was now, death swamp and its quicksand. His hands were tight closed as if his nerve were something tangible that someone in the darkness was trying to tear from his grip. The softness of the earth had given him an idea. He stepped back from the quicksand a dozen feet or so, and like some huge prehistoric beaver, he began to dig. Rainsford had dug himself in in France when a second's delay meant death. That had been a placid pastime compared to this digging now. The pit grew deeper. When it was above his shoulders, he climbed out and from some hard saplings cut stakes and sharpened them to a fine point. These stakes he planted in the bottom of the pit with the point sticking up. With flying fingers, he wove a rough carpet of weeds and branches and with it he covered the mouth of the pit. Then, wet with sweat and aching with tiredness, he crouched behind the stump of a lightning charred tree. He knew his pursuer was coming. He heard the padding sound of the feet on the soft earth and the night breeze brought him the perfume of the general's cigarette. It seemed to Rainsford that the general was coming with unusual swiftness. He was not feeling his way along, foot by foot. Rainsford, crouching there, could not see the general, nor could he see the pit. He lived a year in a minute. Then he felt an impulse to cry aloud with joy, for he heard the sharp crackle of the breaking branches as the cover of the pit gave way. He heard the sharp scream of pain as the pointed stakes found their mark. He leapt from the, his place of concealment. Then he cowered back. Three feet from the pit, a man was standing with an electric torch in his hand. You've done well, Rainsford, the voice of the general called. Your Burmese tiger pit has claimed one of my best dogs. Again, you score, I think, Mr. Rainsford. I'll see what you can do against my whole pack. 
I'm going home for a rest now. Thank you for a most amusing evening. At daybreak, Rainsford, lying near the swamp, was awakened by the sound that made him know that he had new things to learn about fear. It was a distant sound, faint and wavering, but he knew it. It was the bang of a pack of hounds. Rainsford knew he could do one of two things. He could stay where he was and wait. That was suicide. He could flee. That was postponing the inevitable. For a moment, he stood there thinking. An idea that held a wild chance came to him, and tightening his belt, he headed away from the swamp. The bang of the hounds drew nearer, then nearer, still nearer. On a ridge, Rainsford climbed a tree, down a watercourse, not a quarter of a mile away. He could see the, the bush moving. Straining his eyes, he saw the lean figure of General Zaroff just ahead of him. Rainsford made out another figure whose wide shoulders surged through the tall jungle. Weeds. It was the giant Ivan, and he seemed pulled forward by some unforeseen force. Rainsford knew that Ivan must be holding the pack in leash. They would be on him any minute now. His mind worked frantically. He thought of a native trick he had learned in Uganda. He slid down the tree. He got hold of a springy young sapling, and to it he fastened his hunting knife, with the blade pointing down the trail. With a bit of wild grapevine, he tied back the sapling. Then he ran for his life. The hounds raised their voices as they hit the fresh scent. Rainsford knew now how an animal at bay feels. He had to stop to get his breath. The bang of the hounds stopped abruptly, and Rainsford's heart stopped too. They must, must have reached the knife. He shinnied excitedly up a tree and looked back. His pursuers had stopped, but the hope that was in Rainsford's brain when he climbed died, for he saw in the shallow valley that General Zaroff was still on his feet, but Ivan was not. The knife, driven by the recoil of the springing tree, had not wholly failed. Nerve, 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 he panted as he dashed along. A blue gap showed between the trees, dead ahead. Ever nearer drew the hounds. Rainsford forced himself on, the, on toward that gap. He reached it. It was the shore of the sea. Across a cove, he could see the gloomy gray stone of the chateau. Twenty feet below him, the sea rumbled and hissed. Rainsford hesitated. He heard the hounds. Then he leapt far out into the sea. When the general and his pack reached the place by the sea, the Cossacks stopped. For some minutes, he stood regarding the blue-green expanse of water. He shrugged his shoulders. Then he sat down, took a drink of brandy from a silver flask, lit a perfumed cigarette, and hummed a bit from Madame Butterfly. General Zaroff had an exceedingly good dinner in his great panel dining hall that evening. With it, he had a bottle of Paul Roger and half a bottle of Chambertine. Two slight annoyances kept him from perfect enjoyment. One was the thought that it would be difficult to replace Ivan. The other was that his quarry had escaped him. Of course, the American hadn't played the game, so thought the general as he tasted his after-dinner liqueur. In his library, he read to soothe himself from the works of Marcus Aurelius. At 10, he went up to his bedroom. He was deliciously tired. He said to himself as he locked himself in, there was a little moonlight, so before turning on his light, he went to the window and looked down at the courtyard. He could see the great hounds, and he called, better luck another time, to them. Then he switched on the light. A man who had been hiding in the curtains of the bed was standing there. Rainsford, screamed the general. How in God's name did you get here? Swam, said Rainsford. I found it quicker than walking through the jungle. The general sucked in his breath and smiled. I congratulate you, he said. You have won the game. Rainsford did not smile. I am still a beast at bay, he said in a low, hoarse voice. Get ready, General Zaroff. The general made one of his deepest bows. I see, he said. Splendid. One of us is to furnish a repast for the hounds. That means dinner. The other will sleep in this very excellent bed. On guard, Rainsford. He had never slept in a better bed, Rainsford decided.